I challenge you to ask your friends, family, or whoever to name people in Mariana's history. And I guarantee you the names of Capua, Magellan, Haral, and San Vitoris will be the most commonly said. And what all these figures have in common is that they are all men. People seem to easily recall men's contributions in history over women's contributions. And one big reason for this is because women are underrepresented in Mariana's history. A 2018 publication by Pacific historian Anne Hattori that analyzes the representation of women in five Guam history textbooks finds that these books overwhelmingly represent men. Hattori divides the five books in two categories, those that are chronological canonical history textbooks and those written with an island-centered approach. To determine just how gender biased the books are, she counts all the names given in the book's index and records their gender and ethnicity. Although for one index list book, she counts the names from a section of the book. And the gender imbalance she finds is shocking. Her results are as follows. Starting with the first category, we have Guam's first history textbook, a complete history of Guam, authored by Pacarano and Pedro Sanchez in 1964. Out of the 87 names in the book's index, only one is a woman, and she is not even Samoru. The next book, Guahan Guam, The History of Our Island, authored solely by Pedro Sanchez in 1987, is no better. Out of the 185 names from her sample section, 14 are women, and of those 14, half are Tsamoru. The last book in the category is Destiny's Landfall, A History of Guam, authored by Robert Rogers and first published in 1995. In the second edition, which was published in 2011, out of the 171 names in the index, only seven are women, two of whom are Tsamoru. The first edition does not significantly differ. It is clear that all three of these books in the canonical history category overwhelmingly represent men. So how do the two books written with an island-centered approach compare? Surely they must be better because after all, these books were produced from the viewpoint of the Tsamoru people. The first in this category is Historian Tatatanu, The History of Our People, published in 1993 and was written for elementary school children. Out of 31 names, two are women, and of those two, one is a Tsamoru, more specifically the Tsamoru deity Founa. The second and last book in this category is the 1994 publication Imagobetnia Guam, governing Guam before and after the war. Out of the 198 names, 10 are women and 8 of them are Tsamoru. One would think that these books written with an island-centered approach would at least close the gender gap, but that is not the case. They are no better than the chronological canonical history textbooks in representing women. And Hattori, who is a contributor to one of these textbooks, is very well aware of this. As one of the contributors to the Magobetnia Guam textbook, I could still recall the enthusiasm we brought to the project and our deep and earnest desire to present a Tsamoru-centered view of our island's past. Yet as our work demonstrates, even Guam's most intently islander-centered textbooks remain trapped within the confines of a Western historical tradition that largely privileges men's contribution to society and history. In order to represent the Northern Mariana Islands, I analyzed two CNMI history textbooks. Using the same methodology as Hattori, I found similar results to the Guam books. Starting with Tiempo y Mamafotna, Ancient Samoru Culture and History of the Northern Mariana Islands, authored by Scott Russell in 1998, out of the 43 people in the index, three are women, and one of whom is a Tsamoru woman slash deity who is of course Fuuna.
Although if we add the 12 names in Appendix A that were not in the index, we get new results. Out of 55 names, six are women and four out of the six are Tsumoru. However, since these 12 additional names do not even appear in any of the chapters and only as a list in the appendix, I will exclude them. We then have History of the Marianas to Partition, published by Don Farrell in 2011. 24 out of the roughly 369 names are women, and of the 24 women, 13 are Tsumoru. In total, women represent less than 10% of the names in all seven of these history textbooks. It is even less with Tsumoru women, who represent less than 5%. It is clear that our history books overwhelmingly covers men's contributions at a disproportionate level than women's. And there are two significant reasons for this. First, because for the longest time, the primary sources that inform our histories were written by men, about men, and for men. More specifically, in the case of the Marianas, by white European males. And what these men recorded about the Tsumorus and the Marianas reflected their patriarchal Eurocentric ideas and attitudes of what was important. And to them, what was important and worth writing about were men. Not just any men, but men who were of visible political, religious, social, and military importance. Thus, the stories of men were preserved rather than women's. The names and accounts of European explorers, missionaries, leaders, settlers, and military personnel were emphasized rather than the Tsumorus. And the few names of 17th century Tsumorus that they recorded, such as Kapuha, Matapping, and Harau, were Tsumoru men that fit the European idea of who was worthy to be recorded. Male chiefs, nobles, warriors, and religious converts. Similarly, it was generally the elite class of Tsumoru men whose accounts were recorded in the 18th century and beyond. Whenever women are mentioned in the early documents, they are generally nameless, with specific individual women referred to as the daughter, wife, or mother of someone. And while names of Tsumoru women increasingly appear in the records over time, particularly starting in the 19th century, Women's names and stories were largely ignored. So it's understandable why these seven history books underrepresented women because there are more written records about men than women. However, while this is applicable for 16th to 19th century Marianas history and somewhat to the early 20th century Marianas history, this does not excuse the underrepresentation of women in contemporary or post-1945 Marianas history. Because while we can't go back in time and record the accounts of 17th century Tsumoru women, we can record the accounts of living Tsumoru women today and at the bare minimum include some of them in the textbooks, which these four history books failed to do. This leads to the second significant reason for why our history books underrepresented women. Because they are written in the traditional chronological narrative that privileges economic, military, governmental, political institutions, figures, and events. This means that history is conceptualized in a linear fashion, as a timeline, with a beginning, middle, and the present. The book then methodically goes through key events and historical figures in a chronological order that led us to where we are today. And since not everything can be covered in a general history book, especially those meant for the elementary and high school level, as the books must be concise and not too long, the author must filter out information that does not fit the narrative. And if the narrative privileges economic, military, governmental, political institutions, figures, and events, then non-elite groups and marginalized people are usually excluded since they are people who do not have significant power in politics and economics. And as you guess, the people who do have significant power are usually higher class and elite figures such as businessmen, 
politicians, leaders, etc. This is why, for example, you will always see the governors of Guam and the CNMI covered in any standard history book about the Marianas. And the reason why the books follow this chronological narrative that privileges elite groups, political and economic events, is because this is considered the norm, the tradition, for what should be covered in general history textbooks about a state, country, or in the case of Guam and the CNMI, island polities. And since the visible higher class and elite groups contains more men than women, therefore more men are covered in the history books. Okay, that's it. The case is settled. These four books are justified in having a gender gap. Well, not exactly. Because while this explains why more men are represented than women in contemporary history, this does not entirely explain why the gender gap is so huge. I mean, the second edition of Destiny's Landfall contains around 100 pages dedicated to contemporary history, and it was published in 2011, yet there are only two Tsumoru women named in the entire book's index. And it's not because women who have made significant contributions to society don't exist. No, there are several women who have made an impact. I counted all the names in Iman Fadzi, Who's Who in Samoru History, Volume 2, a book published in 1997 that gives brief profiles of many 20th century Samorus. And I found that out of the 459 names, 102 are women. So yes, there is a substantial amount of women that have made significant contributions in contemporary history. So the fact that Samoru women represent less than 5% of the names in these history books that cover contemporary history is inexcusable. And many people do recognize the underrepresentation of women in Mariana's history and are doing something about it. This is what inspired Samoru scholar, activist, and community organizer Laura Souter to write a dissertation about Samoru women, which eventually led to her renowned book, Daughters of the Island, with the second edition published in 1992. In the book, Souter details the accounts of nine contemporary Tsumoru women organizers. This was one of the first major history books about Tsumoru women that was written by a Tsumoru woman. Another significant publication that gives representation to women is Colonial Disease, U.S. Navy Health Policies and the Tsumorus of Guam, 1898 and 1941, published in 2004 by Anne Hattori, where she has an entire chapter dedicated to Tsumoru maternity, the patera or midwife, and gender relations during the U.S. Naval rule of Guam. In 2019, Guampedia published the book Famalao and Guahan, Women in Guam History, which gives the profiles of 28 Samoru women. And these are just a few examples of history books and scholarship that gives good representation to women in the Marianas. And as more women are becoming scholars, business owners, politicians, and so on, it is expected that women will be more represented in the history books. However, we must be cautious to not fall back on the same traditional narrative of privileging people of economic and political power and think that just by adding more elite women in the history books, that will be the sole solution. For example, in November 2018, the people of Guam elected the first female governor and the first female majority in the legislature. These events fit perfectly in the traditional historical narrative, and these events will definitely be covered in future general history textbooks. However, what will not be covered are the experiences of marginalized and non-elite women, because as mentioned already, the traditional historical narrative 
tends to exclude non-elite and marginalized groups. This is not to say that women moving up in society should not be covered or celebrated. Rather, I'm giving you this example to show you that what we intuitively understand as Mariana's history, which consists of a linear timeline that emphasizes the elites, the Guam and CNMI polity, politics, economics, and colonizers, is a learned conceptualization of history and is a very colonial understanding of our history. And the solution to not perpetuate this colonial view of history is to decolonize our history. As Anne Hattori eloquently explains, decolonizing our history will mean reevaluating and maybe even rejecting the conservative historical tradition that defines history as the story of building nations militaries and economies rather than simply identifying more and more elite women to add to the text it may require us to approach history from a social or cultural perspective this shift would also allow for the greater inclusion of both female and male non-elites who made important contributions to island history yet remain silenced by the hordes of those holding official, political, and economic power. Decolonizing our textbooks can enable us to appreciate the joint struggles of ordinary women and men doing extraordinary things to serve their families, villages, and communities. In the process, perhaps we can come closer to remembering and honoring history as they did and do not conforming to a chronology of governors but according to the events that impacted their daily lives, including typhoons, earthquakes, epidemics, feasts, famines, marriages, births, and deaths. It means making space alongside the congressmen for barmaids, mothers, tetsas, and sarahanas. Situs masi for watching. Guahusipulan. Esta.